Good morning. Welcome one and all as we gather in the Lord's house, especially if you're a guest or a visitor, it's great that you could be with us. If you are visiting and would like to leave a record of your visit, you can fill out the inside portion of the service folder and place it in the basket that is directly out of church. We are still in the Lenten season, so obviously our focus is heavily on the cross of our Savior, and specifically today we want to talk about the humility we will have because of what the Lord has done for us. You see, we have our musical group helping us again today. If you didn't grab a musical lead sheet coming in, you can ask for the ushers for one. They'll help you out. Otherwise, as always, we thank them for being here, and whenever you feel comfortable, please join in and sing. We begin our service as we meet with God. In the name of the one who shunned all sin, and the one who embraced the cross for us and for our salvation, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Our opening song, what a beautiful name it is. Lord. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation now revealed to you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. We 
confess our sins to God. Many of you have heard for years that Sundays during Lent are meant to be days when we pause from the heaviness of the season. Some have called the Sundays in Lent mini Easter's. The point is that we never separate our need for God's grace from the reality that such grace has been shown to us by our Savior. We know that grace is ours, but we also know how much we struggle with sin and how often we fall prey to temptation. Due to that, let us humbly but confidently come before our God, asking Him to be merciful and shower us with His grace once again. We join together. Heavenly Father, I know the reality of my sin. I know my sin is the reason Jesus had to go to the cross. I know I should have been the one who was punished. But I also know he did go there for me. Willingly he forfeited his life that I might know the peace of forgiveness and that I might have a place in your family. For the sins that caused Jesus' death, for all my sins, Gracious Lord, please forgive me. Amen. We hear God's forgiveness. A hymn we've been singing for a few years around here is entitled, What Grace Is This? Notice there isn't a question mark at the end of the title. We do not sing this hymn and wonder, what is this grace thing God has showered upon me? Instead, we can put an exclamation point at the end of the title. What grace is this? Why? That grace has been shown to us. And it surpasses anything else in the world. Knowing that grace, grace, rejoice over these words, all your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We pray. Almighty God, we confess that we deserve to be punished for our evil deeds. But we ask you graciously to cleanse us from all sin and to comfort us with your salvation. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Please be seated. Human beings cause problems and hurt and pain and suffering. We face that ourselves and cause that in others. Alone, we can do nothing about this. So we thank God that we are not alone and that someone did something about this problem. That someone was Jesus. As you read our lessons, remember the problem, sin, and rejoice in the perfect solution, Jesus. Our first lesson is from Hosea 5, verse 15 through chapter 6, verse 3. Then I will return to my lair until they have borne their guilt and seek my face. In their misery they will earnestly seek me. Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us, that we may live in his presence. Let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge him. As surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains, like the spring rains that water the earth. Our second lesson is from Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 10. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives his life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. 
But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. Our verse of the day, familiar words from John chapter 3. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Our lesson, which will serve as the basis for our message for today, is from Matthew chapter 20. Now Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. On the way, he took the twelve aside and said to them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and, kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it you want? he asked. She said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they've been prepared by my father. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. We responsibly confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. At this time, our young worshipers are invited forward for the children's message. Looks like all your pals are sleeping in today, so we'll get them in late, don't worry. So, See if you guys can handle this, you're a small group, ready? Good morning. Good morning. Nice work. Now, tell me if what I'm saying is right and it's something you should do. Let's say you're in school and you take a quiz or a test and you get an A. You should run around to everybody else and go, ha, I got an A, you didn't. Do you think we should do that? No, Okay. Let's say you're playing a sport and you score a basket or you get a goal or a touchdown. You should go up to the other team and say, I'm so much better than you, right? No. Okay, let's say mom or dad tells you it's time for bed and you should say, nope, not going to do that. A few smiles and hesitant nods, but or head shaking. No, all those are times when you should be humble. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Humble means we're thinking about other people instead of ourselves. And mostly humble means we're thinking about God, not us. If you do well on a test, you know what you should do? Say a prayer saying, thank you, Lord, for helping me get that A. Whenever something good happens, that really should be our mindset. I didn't do this. God did this for me. And instead of walking around telling everybody how great I am, I should say, thank you, Jesus, because you were great for me. So every day you get a chance to show that you don't want to be cocky or arrogant. You want to be humble, whether it's at home or at school or wherever you are. And we say, Lord, help us to live humbly. 
and thanks for what you've done for us. Let's say a prayer. Dear Jesus, help us always think about you first, then help us think about others, and then after that, we think about ourselves. And bless us that everything we do praises you. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you. May return to your seats. We continue with our hymn of the day. You may want to roll your eyes after I say this next sentence, but I'm going to start with a football story. But you got to realize, I, was, I realized this yesterday, I never come out looking good in any of these stories. So I'm definitely not up here bragging. Instead, I'm pointing out about the things I learned from failure and mistake. And we're going to keep going with that trend today. I believe we were juniors in college. We were playing what might have been the worst college football team in the country, and I'm not kidding at all about that. We were up like 55 to nothing at halftime. 
Almost all of our starters were out after the first quarter. The guy in front of me was about the size of my right leg, which isn't small, but he's not a big fella. Play after play, I was actually getting tired because I was pushing him so far because he was so terrible. And then it happened, you can probably guess where this is going, halfway through the second quarter. I went out to smack him once again, and he did some little guy move. Just got around me. He was so fast, he got in the backfield, and as the quarterback was handing off to the running back, the guy grabbed both of them, drove them to the ground, caused a fumble, and then hopped on the ball. And as much as I'd like to forget this event, it's seared in my brain because one of my friend's dads was taking pictures at the game that day. And there is a picture of our guys on the ground, my guy on the ball, and me standing behind him like this with a what in the world just happened look. I was humbled. There's no other way to say it. So, was that play a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it was bad at the time in that we lost the ball. But in the end, it was a very good thing. After that play and having to watch it on film, I think my coach showed it to me like eight times to drive the point home. Thanks, coach, I got it. But after seeing it that many times, I, just, I vowed to myself, I'm never going to let this happen again. And for the rest of the season, I remembered that play and said, I don't want to do that, I want to do the right thing. Now that's my story, and i got plenty more, and I know you have just as many about times when you needed to be humbled. Knocked down a peg. Time when our ego and arrogance got the best of us. And God will do that. We don't have to search out times when we'll be humbled because they're going to happen. I don't care how old you are, your situation, your position in life, you will be humbled over and over again. So our two responses are these. One, we can get frustrated and angry about that. Or two, we can take to heart the lesson the Lord is teaching us through humility. Obviously, that second one is what we want to do, and that's what we want to do today. We're focusing on our gospel lesson, and this is not that far off from when Jesus will go to Jerusalem to the cross to complete the ultimate sacrifice. <clears throat> the disciples have been with him <clears throat> a couple of years now, two and a half years about, and so they knew what Jesus was all about. They saw him preach and teach. They saw his love and his compassion, how he stood firmly with his father. They saw all those good things. Well, as they're walking, Jesus decides it's time to make things very, very clear for them. Elsewhere, Jesus had talked about how, yes, he would go to Jerusalem, he'd go to the cross, but the first time he's super explicit about that is in our lesson. Look at the first couple of verses. Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. On the way, he took the twelve aside and said to them, so he pulled them away from whatever other groups were following, and he said, come on, huddle, I need to talk to you guys. We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, to be mocked and flogged and crucified. We look at that and think, how in the world could the disciples ever have been confused about what was going to happen? How could they ever say that they were unaware? Jesus is so clear here. So why didn't they get it? If I had to guess, I think they didn't get it because they didn't want to get it. Remember, hardly any of these guys, I don't think any of them came from noble birth or had some kind of job that Everybody was looking up to them and praising them and giving them so much love and respect. Some of them were doing some of the most basic jobs in society that people even looked down upon. But over the last two and a half years, they'd been with Jesus. They'd been part of his team. And no, not everyone loved them, but a whole lot more people loved them than before they were with Jesus. They were welcomed into towns. They were respected. Jesus even allowed them to do some miracles. These guys had been a bunch of nobodies. Jesus made them somebody. They were part of Jesus' group. They were his disciples. So they were only thinking about right now, the power, the privilege, the money, the perks, whatever, that came with being a part of Jesus' gang. They were not thinking about suffering. They were not thinking about sacrifice. They were not thinking about Jesus. They weren't thinking about others. They were completely focused on themselves. And that becomes very clear when you go on with the lesson. They're walking and Jesus told them, remember, I'm going to die. And what are the disciples doing? They're arguing about which one of them is the greatest. 
You can just imagine them, one looking at the other saying, well, I did this. And the other saying, well, I did that. And by the way, you screwed up in that area. I didn't. First time I read this, uh, getting ready for this, it made me think of like a fifth grade group. Like they're sitting here barking and complaining, saying, I'm better. No, I'm better. I'm more awesome. I'm more amazing. That's what the disciples were doing. They were carping and whining. And you can imagine the finger pointing, saying, you're not better, I'm better. You know exactly how this situation played out, because sadly we've seen it too often even in our own lives. And what really brings it to a head is when another person besides the 12 is involved. That's the mother of James and John. We talk about helicopter parents now. They were helicopter parents 2,000 years ago. She comes to Jesus and she says, I have a request. I want one son to sit on your right and the other son to sit on your left. I want them to have positions of power and glory when you rule the earth, Lord. Mom went for the boys and said, they should have this honor. They should have this privilege. Please, Jesus, do this for us. And you heard the word. We don't use it much. The disciples heard this and they were indignant. They were fired up and they were ticked off. And I'm sure part of the reason is because they wanted those seats of power. They had done more than James and John. They were more deserving of having Jesus say, you are my right hand and my left hand, guys. None of them were thinking about Jesus. None of them were thinking about their mission. None of them were thinking about his mission. None of them were thinking about the fact he just told them, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and I will die. They were only thinking about themselves. If you can't figure out where we're going to go from here, you've probably been sleeping the first three, four minutes here. We look at them and we think, how in the world could they be so arrogant As to not only have this discussion, but to do it within earshot of Jesus. What in the world is wrong with them? Well, we're always within earshot of Jesus. Everything we say and do is known by Him. And when you think about it, don't we do the same thing as the disciples? Maybe we're a little quieter about it. Maybe. But don't we often have that same mindset in our heart? That we are that great, that we deserve this position Or at least we deserve an easier life. We do this at home. We either think or say, I'm the one who keeps this place running. I'm the one who makes all the money. I should be respected. I should be praised. I should be appreciated for that. We do it on teams. This team, work team, sports team, whatever, this team would fall apart if it wasn't for me. I am so vital. I am such a cog that they would have nothing if it wasn't for me. And sadly, we can even do it here at church. The service I offer, the things I do, no one knows about them. But if I didn't do them, they'd never get done. Do people realize how much money I'm giving to help with this program or that program? Do they realize that for 25 to 30 years I've, I've taught this or helped out in that way? Again, we may not say those things, but don't lie to me and I won't lie to myself. So often we think that. Our mindset is we deserve praise, we deserve credit, We deserve to be noticed for this. And if anything, we're getting really good at the humble brag. We want to make sure it's out there. We don't want to look like a jerk, but we want it out there so everybody will understand how great we are and how great of a job we've done, and they will respect and praise us for that. But I hope you see just how deadly sinful arrogance can get. When we're, and the phrase when I played was, read your own press clippings. When we're reading our own press clippings and believing we really are that great and fantastic, is that going to lead us to humbly walk before our Lord? Is that going to lead us to look for opportunities to serve? Is that going to cause us to make it about other people? Or is all the attention going to be on us? What we did and what we deserve because of what we did. You know your answer and I know mine and they're the same answer. So easily we go down that road. In other words, we're acting directly just like the disciples did. And just as they should have gotten a stern rebuke from Jesus, we should get the same. When we arrogantly demand this or arrogantly expect that. But instead of coming with thunderbolts and lightning, Jesus takes his time to teach the disciples and to teach us. The the mother of the two had just made the request, but really she was speaking for all the disciples. They all wanted this. And so Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking. 
You're not quite thinking about what it means to follow me and what service is going to entail. He says, can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? Again, we know what that drink of suffering was. Uh, Crucified, hated, found guilty, spit upon, flogged, all that stuff. Jesus says, you're only thinking about the good parts of following me. Are you ready to handle the tough stuff? Are you ready to drink from the cup of suffering? That should have reset them to the point where they're like, eh, maybe we should back off a bit. Nope. We can, they answered. They're still hanging on to their arrogance saying, it's about me. And I can do it, and I'm worthy, and I'm going to get everything that's coming to me, Jesus. But knowing what was ahead, knowing what they needed, Jesus keeps going. He said, you will indeed drink from my cup. He's flat out telling them, guys, you will suffer for your faith. Over the next couple of days and weeks, and for the rest of your lives. We bring it up every now and then that if history is correct, every one of the disciples except one died in a brutal, horrible way as they were sharing the gospel far and wide. They were thinking only about the good life, the perks of being with Jesus, and Jesus is saying, no, it's going to be a life of suffering and pain and hardship. And knowing that they needed to fully understand this before he completed the work he was about to complete, This verse, he called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their high officials exercise exercise authority over them. He's basically saying, this is how the world works. I'm best, praise me, love me, tell me how fantastic I am. All while trying to put on a veneer of, oh, I'm just humbly serving. Jesus is clearly saying, this is not the way it should be with you guys. You are part of my family. I did this for you. I've given you all these blessings. It's not beat your chest and draw attention to yourself. It's put attention on me, the Savior, and on my gracious Heavenly Father. All week long as I've been going through this, that phrase keeps coming to my mind, not so with you. All too often it is so with us. I demand this. I should have this. This is right. I suffer. I sacrifice. Why aren't people appreciating that more? Why aren't they telling me how great I am? Why don't they notice me and give me some kind of award for this? Again, we'd rarely say these out loud, But this is what goes through our sinful minds because we're just like the disciples. And in being just like the disciples, as this verse says, we're being just like the world. The world fights over positions and titles, about rights and benefits because to the world, there's only one person that matters and that's self. Jesus is clearly saying, you guys are different. You are my people, made made clean by my perfect work for you. Just as everything I do is not about serving myself, but it's about serving you, so everything you do should be about serving me and others. And of course, nothing has changed. Whether it's in the home or at church or at school or work, wherever it may be, humble service is what our Lord wants. Is that always easy? Absolutely not. Part of it is our world and our sinful minds say you deserve some kind of praise or credit for this, so there's that constant issue. But sometimes people just, they don't seem to be worthy of being served. They don't seem to be worthy of the things that we're going to do for them. I'm trying to purposely create a convoluted mess of all the reasons why we can say, I shouldn't serve. I'm above this. That person doesn't do anything for me. I'm not going to get anything in return. Why should I do it? That's how the world works. But that's not how it works for us as Christians. And that's most definitely isn't how it worked with our Savior. Again, he said to them, not so with you. Don't be like the world. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. You can probably guess the two words we're going to highlight here. Servant and slave. Those people don't do what they want to do. A servant or a slave does what their owner or master says. That's the position Jesus is telling them to take. You're not some high disciple. You're not some lifelong Christian who's Given all this and done, that, done all that, your mindset should be, I'm not just a servant, I am a slave. I will do as told. And of course, we're told by our Heavenly Father. Now, as difficult as these words were to hear, Jesus didn't drop, stop there and say, we're done, let's move on. Instead, he wraps this whole thing together beautifully. He says, he, the Son of Man, did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. We're not far from Good Friday, and we see the ultimate act of service on that day. Our Savior was nailed to the tree. The author of life was killed. 
true God, gave up his life as true man on that cross. The ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate ransom. And not once did he say, you better respect me more for this, you better love me, you better tell me how great I am. Instead, he knew what needed to be done, and in perfect humility, he did it. And because he did, all those times we have been so arrogant, those have been washed away. Instead of seeing us making it about ourselves, our Heavenly Father only sees us making it about Him and about others. Our slate of sins has been washed clean. All the arrogant, selfish sins, they're gone. And instead, we stand before God as His humble, faithful people because that's what Jesus, through His work, made us. And knowing that's what He made us, what will we do? How do we show our thanks for this? How do we show our appreciation? That verse says it. We don't walk around looking to be served. We don't walk around demanding that people respect us for what we are and what we've done. Instead, we walk humbly, looking for opportunities to serve and looking for, in all things, opportunities to give God the glory for all the amazing grace that He has shown us. I'd like to tell you it's easy. It's not. Because we live in a world where it says self is most important. But then that world turns around and says, but not really you. Now you've got to do what I want. It's all against Christianity at its core. But when we do what we're doing today, and remember, at the heart and core of our faith is a humble Savior who gave up everything to win our salvation. And when we focus on that heart and core, we are built up. We are encouraged to say, this is my way to thank you, Lord, to walk humbly before you and to walk humbly before all those you bring in my life. I pray we always remember this, but again, especially remember this as we come through Good Friday. So easily we could hate ourselves on that day, saying part of the reason he had to die is because I was unwilling to humble myself before the Lord and others. But let your Christian heart speak out. Listen to God's word that says he did humbly die, not because he owes you, but because he loves you. To pay for all your sins and to make you a humble member of God's kingdom. We thank the Lord for that perfect humility. We thank the Lord for the results. And we pray that builds us up every day to show our thanks by humbly serving in love in all we do. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding guard your hearts and minds through Christ our Savior. At this time we gather a thank offering for our Lord. Perfect Savior, as we are only a short time away from when we will again remember your death on Good Friday, we cannot thank you enough for the perfect grace you showed in taking all our sins upon you and paying for them in full. Because of your sacrifice, we know we are part of your family now, and we will fully enjoy the benefits of that when we get to the heaven you won for us. Keep us faithful, focused, and diligent that we finish this Lenten season the same way you want us to go through and finish every day with our eyes of faith on you and your perfect love for us. Be with our brother in faith, Bob Morrison, who is in the hospital due to heart issues. We pray that you would help them figure out exactly what the problem is and that a solution can be found quickly. Above all, keep Bob strong in faith and help him and all of us remember with thanks that we know what awaits when our time here is up. Bless those members of the congregation who have birthdays today and this week. Kim Machieski, Nancy Hofferman, Luke Sharp, Jan Haas, Sue Hausman, Bennett Schmidt, Alex Erdman, Jenica Jensen, Rhett Erdman, Timothy Holtz, Jake Wagner, Kaylee Zingzheim, Kristen Brazy, Keegan Gonzalez, Amy Miller, and Michelle Scheidegger. And bless those couples who soon celebrate a wedding anniversary, Todd and Annabelle, Matt and Holly Kinnick, and Tim and Renee Berg. In your name we ask these things. Hear us as we join to pray the prayer you taught us. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
Oh, Lord, our prayer as we end the service is simple. Keep us focused, focused on what we need from you and why, and focused on how, through Christ, we have everything we need and will continue to have those things until you bring us home to the heaven our Savior won for us. Help us with hearts of faith to thank you in every way we can for such grace and mercy. In Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Our final song. Would you please rise as we sing our final song?
so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and gives his bread? Please be seated. <clears throat> 